So this will be my review of chapter 838 of One Piece. And there is a lot to talk about. There a lot of things happened in this chapter. Um, let's start with the cover page. I don't usually talk about the cover pages, but I found this particularly interesting. So let's start with that. Um, we see Shanks, who is apparently at a wedding. And when I went through my read-through the second time, I spent a good 10 minutes just on this cover page trying to figure out what was going on. So obviously, obviously we have a wedding, and let me just read the description of it. It says that at a wedding that takes place within the ruins of a certain island. So, they're at a wedding. It's obviously not Shanks' wedding, because if you look in the background, there's some guy who is who has their back to the three main guys in the page, and he's cheering, so he's obviously looking at the couple who just got wet. So it's not Shanks who's married Makino, whoever might think this. Um, but it's obviously something that he has a good relationship with, because why else would he be there? Also, it says the ruins of a certain island, which means that this has to be an island that we know of, since it says a certain island and not a random island or a random island or just an island, as, you sh as Oda usually says. So I'm thinking that this is an island that we know. And now here I'm thinking, what island do we know that has cacti? Because that's the only trait this island has is cacti, and I seriously can't figure it out because it's also the ruins of an island. So it's somewhere that has been destroyed. Like leave in the comments below where you think Shanks are, yeah, Shanks is, and who got married because I am. Extremely curious and I think this will be important later on because recently the store the cover pages and the cover stories have been Extremely important. So yeah, but let's move on the actual chapter starts off with Luffy versus pretzel And we have pretzel slowly getting back up on his feet and Luffy being very determined to beat him so that he can go on and see Sanji because as we know pretzels chopped a lot of ship shit about Sanji last week, so Luffy's thoroughly pissed off um but they clash, and Luffy hits him with another Kong gun, I think? I didn't write that down. Um, but he hits him, and Cracker falls into two pieces. But as Luffy's arm stretches further, after he's basically cracked Cracker open, something pops up in the middle and hits Luffy with a sword and cuts halfway through his arm, probably it's like through his bone. Or to his bone, so that's pretty painful. And we see Luffy kind of uh, taking his arm back and just like holding the wound, being in pain. And he asks, Who the hell are you? Because some dude just appeared with a sword out of nowhere. And we find out that Cracker is actually using a armor made out of biscuits because he has the bisk bisk fruit, which allows him to manip manipulate biscuit and Apparently, he uses these armors because he cannot stand pain, like, even, even getting a single shot is just too much for him, which is a pretty big weakness, but eh, if he can use the armor then, okay. Uh, pretzel? Pretzel. Uh, Krakow also says that Luffy is actually quite strong because very few people have actually managed to make Krakow reveal his true self and get out of the uh, armor. But basically, as Cracker just keeps talking and talking about how strong he is and how he can basically manipulate all the biscuit around him and create biscuit from nothing, and he's just so strong, Luffy actually has this really interesting face at some point where he's just, he, it's kind of like he realizes that these people are way stronger than he expected them to be. And he kind of did have like the same face in the last chapter where he also said this guy is really strong. But you have to remember, at that point, he just saw like the armor thing, and I don't know how much of Cracker's real power Luffy could sense at that point, because he was covered with um, the biscuit thing. And we know from So that it's not always that Luffy's observation hockey works to its maximum, there are ways to, uh, to counter it. Because, if you remember, it was shown in the anime recently too, uh, when Luffy fought BB and the other dude whose name I've forgotten, um, he was actually surrounded by Pedro and a bunch of his, like, uh, underlings or people who worked with Pedro, and Luffy didn't realize until they all retreated. So we know that either Luffy's observation hockey isn't the best, which I doubt, or there are ways to counter it, which I think might be what has happened here, because I doubt that Luffy would have underestimated him this much if he could have sensed his real strength. Um, 
which is why Luffy then makes a face of, oh crap, I'm in deep shit. Of course this doesn't stop Luffy because he's very determined and very stubborn and he wants to see Sanji no matter what. And then Cracker has this really, really good line where he says that no matter how much you fight and no matter what you do, there will always be someone who is stronger than you. Of course that's kind of just foreshadowing his own downfall because he's so damn cocky, but it's still interesting because as I've been saying all along, Luffy is not ready to fight Big Mom. And I really think that this fight is highlighting that, like, opinion, it's not an opinion, but why Luffy isn't ready to fight Big Mom, because he can hardly take on this guy, and when it comes down to it, the one dude that he wants to take down is Vince Smoke Judge. Either way, the fight continues, and Luffy uses, I think this is a new technique called Kong Organ, I'm pretty sure this is a new technique, and it's basically, what I get from it is, it is Kong Gun mixed with Gatling Gun, so yeah. Um, but Cracker uh, blocks everything with all of his biscuit clone armor things, but Luffy breaks through them. But as he breaks through them, Cracker goes underneath them and kind of aims for Luffy with his sword. And I can't really figure out if Luffy dodges this or if he gets like a little cut on his cheek. Um, but either way, we stop the fight there. But what is interesting, because we do not get back to this fight and we also skip to the morning, so we probably won't see the rest of this fight. But at the last panel that we see of the two of them, Luffy has basically dodged underneath the sword and is ready to punch and attack at him. And because Cracker is so weak to pain, if Luffy gets this one punch in, he should be able to defeat him, right? So that's probably what I think happened, because I doubt that Luffy has been defeated and Big Mom wouldn't know about it. But I will go into that later when we go to Big Mom's storyline. We also have about half a page or something that focuses on Nami, who has basically taken the control of all the homies because of Lola's, Lola's or not Lola's memory card, but the memory card that Lola gave her to Big Mom. Um, and it's basically just her, she's standing on Baum, the big tree that um, Brulee was standing on top of moving around with, and all the homies are so scared of her. They are so scared of her that they say that she is scarier than both Cracker and Big Mom by a mile, and that's super interesting. So she basically has them in her palm, um, which I'm sure will be important for how they get out of the forest. I mean, by now it's morning, so I'm pretty sure that they are out of the forest since we just skipped everything, because that would be a great surprise for Luffy to just appear somewhere, or for Luffy and Nami to just appear somewhere, and... We don't know why and how and Big Mom and everyone will be surprised. So yeah, that's what I think will happen. <laughs> we then have another short storyline, which is the one that focuses on Ch Chupper? Chopper and Carrot. And we basically see them inside Brulee's mirror world. And we have this uh, <laughs> these two weird panels where Chopper's like, Okay, Carrot, I've got a plan, but you need to call me Big Brother for this to work or something. Um, and for some reason, Carrot's just like, well, you're proper now, because that's how you say brother chopper, shortly and cutely, I guess. Um, I don't know what the point of that was, but it was quite funny and cute, so yeah. But basically, Chopper's plan is to not try to escape Brulee's mirror world, but to take advantage of it, because as they find out, they can see through every single mirror on Whole Cake Island from their position at the moment. And I believe that I said this at least one or two chapters ago. Um, because that would kind of make sense for Boulay to be able to move in the, within all the mirrors and for her victims to do the same. Um, they are chained up though with those really big like iron shackles with the balls that kind of makes it hard to move, but Carrot is a mink and she is unbelievably strong. We've seen this count uh, countless times and Chopper is quite strong too, so it shouldn't be that much of a problem. Um, of course it will slow their speed down if they have to fight, but I really kind of doubted. Um, they'll probably have to fight Brulee at some point since she's the only way to escape the mirror world, but for now their position is quite good because they have the opportunity to get in touch with literally everyone on Whole Cake Island. And that's not only the uh, Straw Hats, so Luffy and Nami and Brooke and eventually Sanji or hopefully Sanji. They'll also be able to get in touch with Jinbei, who, wherever he is, Caesar, who I've said will somehow become important, Probably Peckham's who's been fe who's been fed to sharks, but you know he's probably gonna survive because this is One Piece. Um, other characters, uh, Pudding, because we still don't know what's up with her. So they'll probably be able to get in contact with those people, spy on the Vinsmokes and Big Mom, trying to figure out how how they'll 
have to get into the castle, what's the easiest option if they need to save Sanji and all those things. So they'll probably be really fucking important. We then cut to Brooke and Pedro, again a very short story, where we see that they have basically gone inside one of the homies who is a guard on patrol and from what Pedro says, once this guard has finished his patrol, he will go back to the castle to uh, stay there for something, uh, something. But basically they'll be able to infiltrate the castle, um, which is now interesting because they will be inside the castle where Sanji and his brother and the rest of his family will come to when they have the meet and greet thing that I'm also gonna go, in, go into later. Um, so the question is here, will Brooke and Pedro meet the Beansmokes or just at least see them? Because they'll be pretty fucking close at this point. Um, so yeah, I'm super interested in seeing what that'll be because I really doubt that they'll just get to the Pony Cliff and then just go back to the Sunny. I mean, that would be the most boring storyline. Plus, we know that Brooke knows of the Mean Smoke and he's probably still holding back some information because he wants to spare Sanji or something, I don't know. Um, and Pedro also has shit that he hasn't been talking about. So, yeah. Information... things to be revealed. <laughs> the next storyline we jump to is Big Moms and we basically have this one page where she's just talking to her homies which are all cakes and sweets, um, which is super weird. Uh, at one point she also talks to her hat, so yeah. But basically we find out that today the Veensmokes and her and probably some of her children will have some sort of meet and greet and I'm guessing that this meet and greet will consist of things like awkward family meals where Sanji will be extremely uncomfortable and I'm guessing that Pudding will be there too because as they say they will also have their what is it called an exchange of engagement gifts um, I have a feeling that this won't just be an exchange of regular gifts but there will be something else I have a weird feeling just because that we might see Sanji fight in some sort of like practice match um, because as he is opposed to Mary Pudding and he then become a part of Big Mom's crew it would make sense for her to want to assess his strength um, that might be fanfic territory that I'm in right now but I'd really want Sanji to fight um, EGG or be forced to fight EGG because of what happens later in this chapter um, but yeah we also have a kind of mini report on what is going on with the straw hats, at least what Big Mom is no knows is going on because she asks what happened to those pests. Um, and one of the cakes, I think it is, is like, well, we sent Cragger after them, so he's probably dealt with them by now. But here's the thing, right? It's morning and Big Mom for some reason has no confirmation that Cracker has beaten Luffy or just the straw hats in general. Which, again, makes it seem like Luffy probably won that fight and he and Nami and... Yeah, he and Nami and maybe Pound are now somewhere else that's hopefully not the seducing woods. Um, and they will probably pop up somewhere. Um, another interesting thing that Big Mom says is that she believes that if Luffy were to rescue Sanji, she would have, he would have to do so before Sanji went into her castle because at that point her his chance would just become zero. Like he had to stand no chance once Sanji's in there. Which of course means that Sanji will go inside the castle and they'll save him there, but mm. um but yeah, it's actually interesting that it says that because that means that Big Mom thinks that there will there's still a chance for them to be able to save Sanji. So she's not underestimating them, at least not in completely. Um which is really smart of her because so far every almost every single villain that Luffy has been against have severely underestimated him and been like, you're just a brat, you can't do shit, um, or I'm just stronger than you because I always win, blah blah blah. So yeah, that's interesting how she's really taking Luffy seriously here. Um, and even though he has such a hard time against Krag, she's still like, well, unless Sanji's inside the castle, he still has a chance to save him. 
Lastly, we find out that the wedding will take place inside Big Mom's castle, which probably means that Luffy will get into the castle and stop the wedding just before Sanji or Pudding or Brutus say I do. So we go to the last part of the chapter where we finally have the older brothers Itaji and Niji arrive at the German kingdom, which is docked in Whole Cake Island. So yeah, they are now here and we have this beautiful, very very beautiful double spread where we have a panel, or in some cases two panels, focused on each and every one of the Beansmoke family members. Except, of course, Mama Beansmoke, who we haven't seen yet because she's either dead at the reverie or just not there. Um, there are a lot of theories speculating her. Um, if you've been following me for a while, you will know that I think that she is either dead because Sanji killed her, or she is just a very mean bitch. Um, I really hope the first option is true, but I think that is more fanfiction theory. Uh, yeah, that's more fanfiction y, so yeah. I'm gonna start by talking a bit about Itichi and Niji because as they arrive, um, we have this very beautiful big panel of them just walking, and we have Itichi in front and Niji going behind him. And Niji is for some reason quite annoyed at the fact that he isn't there to greet him. And let me just go into this for a bit, because why would Oda specifically not use a name in this piece of dialogue? Because if it's their father, why not just say their father, we've already met him. If it's Yonji, why not just say Yonji, we've already met him. And if it's Sanji, why not just say Sanji, because we already met him. Like, usually you say he to be vague because it's a person that we haven't met yet, or a person that you wouldn't expect for them to be talking about. So when they say he, I'm wondering who they're referring to because I really doubt that they are referring to either their father or one of their two younger brothers. Um, so yeah, I am guessing that they might be talking about like someone who is like the head of their techno technology apartment, the apartment department, um, because when you return home from war, you should be checked up. And while they are probably not injured, they might have used some of their tools and they might be broken or something. Um, I have absolutely no clue. Let me know in the comments below what you think uh, or who you think should have met them there. Um, because why not just say the name of the person? I don't know. But while Niji is quite annoyed with this, Ichiji is very calm and collected and it's just like, pipe down Niji, just calm the fuck down. And he looks very dignified, and he looks like he's better than everyone else. He looks, he looks very much like a prince with his expression, but a very like stuck-up prince, um, which is how I imagine that he is. We also get their nicknames. So where Reiju is Poison Pink and Yonji is Winch Green, we have Niji who is Electric Blue and Ichiji who is Sparking Red. And this is really interesting because. Now I'm thinking that we've seen Reiju, obvi she obviously has something to do with poison. Um, Yonji, when he was defeated by Sanji, he has his face dented in, so he's probably like a cyborg or something, which goes along with his name Winch. So electric and sparking. Electric is obviously just lightning, he probably has some sort of lightning abilities, and while it's not the lightning devil fruit because Enel has that and he's not dead, um, it has to be techno technology-based, um, and sparking makes me think of fire. And who else do we know who uses fire? Sanji. Um, and I know a lot of people have been speculating that Sanji and Ichiji are foils, so they will be very different in literally everything. While a lot of people thought that they were opposites, wouldn't it be interesting if the two of them had very simu similar powers but were extremely different in their personalities, which would again make for a really interesting fight between the two of them. I think that a lot of people would want EDG and Sanji to fight at some point. Um, I stand by that I want him to fight Reiju and for her to be his first female opponent, and I would then want EDG to fight Nami, um, because I am also really tired of Nami only fighting female oppo opponents, so it would be a nice switch for the two of them. Um, and also it would give Nami a really strong opponent um, who she would really have to fight hard to beat. 
So I want to talk a little bit about the outfits that they are wearing and more specifically the belts that we see all of the male uh, children have in the Beesmokes family. Uh, so we see that Ishti has his a belt where he has um, some sort of symbol that looks like a flower and I can't quite figure out what the hell this is but I feel like it has to do with his power um, for some reason and I know I already said that he must have something to do with fire but it has to be different from uh, Akaina's power, from Sabo's power, from the fire that Sanji uses, from the fire that Luffy uses so um, I don't know if it's going to be a the little fruit power or something that's technology based. It's probably going to be the second option since they are known for their technology. But it's interesting what this symbol might mean because I feel like there's a meaning behind it. Nietzsche's symbol is their pirate Jolly Roger symbol thing, even though they aren't actually pirates. Um, but I went to the wiki and that's what it said, so yeah. But it's that and then... It's like a thunderbolt, which of course makes sense since he is electric blue. Um, and his symbol symbolizes, symbolizes um, resembles uh, Yonji's because he also has their skull Jolly Roger thing. But then behind it, instead of a thunderbolt, he has kind of like a gear, uh, which goes along with his name, Winch Green. Um, what's then interesting is that if we look at their father, he doesn't have the symbol on his belt. He has this kind of fiery thing and then the double six. Um, and Reiju doesn't have anything at all. Uh, the only thing that goes that's kind of a pattern in her costume are the spiral things. Um, which I can't figure out what it means because she is supposedly poison, right? But how do you draw poison, I guess? So, mm. um, Another interesting thing um, is that I went back to, of course, look at all of their costumes and the only ones to carry the double six on their, or actually the only ones to not carry the double six on their costume is Nichi. Um, I've been looking at this panel for a long time now and I can't figure out where he should have the double six because Nichi has it on his chest, Rachel has it on her legs. Um, Yonchi also has it on his chest, and their father has it on, like, the lower part of his cloak or whatever it is. Um, so I'm beginning to think that Nichi is slightly different here. Um, in a different way that Sanji is the black sheep, of course. Um, but yeah, I'm wondering why that is. Uh, let me know in the comments below. I feel like I said that a lot, but please let me know what you think, because I feel that it's interesting that he's the only one to not show off their name. Like the double six should be infamous at this point. So why isn't he the only, why is he the only one not showing it on his body? So lastly, I want to talk about Sanchi's relationship with these two brothers because we've know so far that he hates his father. He doesn't think too much of Yonji as he already fought him and beat him. Uh, Rachel, he's just unbelievably cold towards um, and try to dismiss her as much as possible, but. Um, First we have Yonji who says this I can't wait to see the look on Sanji's face when he sees them Them I am guessing refers to Ichi and Ichi as they just arrived So that makes sense And then we have this really fucking heartbreaking panel of Sanji Where he's literally, ju he's just gripping himself and shivering with fear As he looks at his, br at his, brother, at his brothers arrive Um so there has to be, whether it's both Ijiji and Niji or just one of them, in which case I would think it's Ijiji, there is some extremely dark and bad history between them. Like, we already know that he hates his family and that they didn't treat him well. But Yonji was part of, like, the bullying thing that we saw in the last flashback. And I'm guessing since it was just, it was such a short flashback that it had had that that thing had happened multiple times at that point. It was something that they were all used to, Sanji getting bullied by his brothers and Reiji not giving a damn, his father not giving a damn. So why would his reaction to Yonji be so different from his reaction to Ichiji and Niji or just one of them? Um, again, Yonji did say them, so it must be the both of them, but I think that 
there will be some deeper history with at least one of the brothers as well as Reiju because I really feel like women will play a big part in this arc as this is Sanji. Okay, so I feel like I have been talking for a long time now and though I could literally keep talking about this chapter in forever, I'm going to save some of this for next week where I might do some sort of theory or discussion video about Sanji or something that's happening at the moment. So yeah, let me know in the comments below what you thought of this chapter and please answer the questions that I asked because I am really interested in knowing what you guys think about this chapter because so much happened. And if you liked anything that I had to say, please leave a thumbs up on the video and subscribe to me if you want to see more of me. I also do reviews of Haikyuu and Shokek no Soma and those reviews should be up later today in hopefully not too long. So yeah, subscribe to me if you're interested in that and until next time, bye!